Green, and today we're going to talk about the winning strategy for a high GRE score. Nice to meet you guys. <clears throat> this is me, Dave. And um, before I say any more, I just want to make sure you guys can hear me all right. <clears throat> Sorry, on the right side of your screen, you have a chat function. If just one of you guys could tell me through there, I can hear you, Dave, so that I know I'm not just talking to myself here to my computer. That would be great. I see some of you are typing, which is already reassuring. Hey, Gloria, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Francisco. So thank you guys for being with me. We have an hour together. And right off the bat, I want to say thank you for joining us and um, present you with an offer we have for you as a token of our gratitude. Um, for the next 24 hours, you can get 25% off any of our GRE courses. Uh, there's a link which we just sent in the chat window. So uh, take us up on that um, now or at the end of this webinar. But uh, it's, a, it's an offer. Uh, thank you very much for responding. Suri Navia, hope I said that right. And Zaurbeck, Ditto, and Adrian. Um, great, I'm happy you guys are, are here, you're, are, are answering me, are using the chat. And feel free to use it throughout because um uh because just feel free to ask questions i i will enjoy it more if you do and hopefully you'll get something out of it so before we talk dive into our topic which is how to get a high score i want to talk to you guys a little, for a few minutes just about <coughs> sorry who we are <coughs> at exam pal um what, what we actually do so um, Example is a course that we founded as a group of test prep teachers that um, understood that students all around the globe are paying too much for the wrong product. And what's worse, they only realize that they're paying too much for the wrong product when it's too late, when the course is done. And wh why is this? What are they missing? What are these regular courses missing? Well, for one thing, it's kind of like that feeling when someone explains something to you and you just don't get it. So this is what we feel it's like to prepare for an admissions test, such as the GRE, in which questions can have many different possible solution paths. And you need to find the fastest one. But the thing is, is that students all over the world and all these courses are bombarded with lots of uh, questions and tips and tricks that are there in a one-size-fits-all kind of way. They're all there to help everyone the same way. And <clears throat> for this reason, kind of brick-and-mortar regular courses can often be quite frustrating because they're not um, personalized in any way. Another thing they can be is, for the same reason, ineffective. Uh, these tests and then the GRE, chiefly among them, are really all about time or about how quick we can be. And if we just teach everyone one way to solve, so for some people it's going to be perhaps very effective, but for others not so much because um, we all have different strengths and weaknesses. Some of us are going to be fast with just doing a lot of quick calculations in our head, and others it's going to take them a long time, and we're going to be better at applying some logical tool. We're going to talk a lot about, about this today. Um, and finally, just studying with a regular course can be very time consuming because by definition, if you're doing questions of all levels, you're doing a lot of questions that are too hard for you and thus you're not learning that much from them, but you're probably just getting frustrated and you're doing a lot that are easy for you and you're probably just being bored. And uh, rather than solving ones that are at your level or a little bit above your level. <coughs> Contra to all these, what does ExamPal do? Well, ExamPal studies the way that you think. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to talk about this more in a second, but basically we get feedback from you as a student all throughout the course. How are you thinking? What tools are you using? Why did you make a mistake that you made? And we use all that information to find the best solution tools for you and the ones you should work on. We also study the effectiveness of all the possible methods using the facts 
that we have thousands of students from all over the world. And so we have a lot of statistics and information about what, though, how most people um, solve each question and what differentiates people who want to solve it in different ways. And then we combine both of these pieces of data, your personal strengths and weaknesses, and the general popular consensus about the, how, what is the most efficient way to solve each question. We combine them to create one recommendation for you. This is how we think you should solve this. And what it all comes down to really is that we've realized that the GRE isn't about uh, knowledge, right? It's, it's high school knowledge, the knowledge that we actually use there. Um, and it isn't about a lot of other things you might think it's about. The one thing that it is about is a skill which we call cognitive flexibility, which is your ability to change, <coughs> excuse me, your ability to change the set of tools that you have very quickly. According to, and adapting to the changes in the data that you're getting. So the test is throwing at you with very harsh, under very harsh time constraints, throwing out you very radically different stuff. One second, it's an algebra question, then it's geometry, and then it's some kind of word problem, and we need to react. And that's what we work on a lot. We don't just provide you with the knowledge you need, but rather we're training you to find the fastest way to solve each question. So what does it actually look like? What does our course have? So for each topic, there are interactive video lessons. Um, why are they interactive? Well, there are questions inter interspersed throughout them. And again, the, our st studying you begins here. We're already getting feedback on how you're doing. And so for each uh, topic, and by topic, I don't mean the quantitative section. I mean, you know, interest, like subtopics that are in that section. We have <coughs> both an introduction uh, where we teach the fundamentals and a lesson in which we talk about different solution tools for this specific topic. And then uh, we move on to the practice phase, where in the first stage, we call it the diagnostic phase, we just see how you do. So let's look for a second at this question that's on the screen. This is an example of a question of which there are several different possible ways to solve, right? You could um, use the logical approach by figuring out the ratio between the numerator and the denominator, not doing any calculations, just using this general logical rule. You could go for the precise approach by simplifying the algebraic expression, <laughs> or you could use what we call the alternative approach by plugging in simple numbers. All of these different tools are gonna get us to the correct solution. Um, and the question is, what is the best one? So in the diagnostic phase, we're learning what you prefer and what your level is by, um, by showing you questions with different types of solutions and seeing how you go. Then comes the improvement phase, and where we focus on your level and we find the best questions for you to solve in order to improve your skills. And finally, sorry, this is the improvement phase in which we ask you for your feedback. What were the tools you used? So what were the reasons for your mistake after each question? And finally, we utilize all this in the last part, which is the optimization phase, in which we tell you after each question, this is how we think you should solve it. So on the screen now, you have an example of a question that has four possible solutions. And you'll notice we rate the match that we find between the solution to you. So they're ranked. Um, so they, yeah, that's us. That's what we do. Um, it's basically we're using, instead of just machine learning, we're using machine teaching. We're using um, artificial intelligence in order to teach you. And um, we have all kinds of awards. Um, students are very happy with us. And what's hopefully, I think, more important to you is that um, we have a success guarantee, which I don't know of any other course that has a real success guarantee. If you have already an official score from another, uh, yeah, on the award slide for sure. Um, but the success guarantee is if you have a score from, if you've already taken a test, then we guarantee um, an improvement, uh, different different for each uh, score. You can go to go to our site, and you'll see the page with exactly the improvement we we um, we guarantee, or your money back. Okay, so um, 
uh, it's it's a uh, sorry, it's seven points, the success guarantee, I should say. So um, anyway, that's us. Um, and hopefully you'll use this and and uh, take us up. As I said, we have uh, twenty five percent off just for the next twenty four hours. So don't be shy. And without further ado, let's jump into um, the reason we're here today, which is how to join the one hundred and sixty club. Those that score in the in the top percentiles. So the truth is. Um, the whole introduction I just had now about exam is actually saves us talking about the first part and we can jump right in because <laughs> the first tool we're going to talk about is cognitive flexibility, which I already defined for you, right? The ability to quickly find the fastest way to solve each question and apply it. So what we do in exam in the course, and, and, and this is, again, this is what we have realized to be just a key skill throughout the whole entire exam, each and every question, above and beyond any specific topic. Um, Francisco, listen, um, I can show you it. it um, you're going to get, all of you will get a full recording of the uh, presentation of this whole lecture later. So you'll be able to, at your leisure, <coughs> watch any screen. Um, for now, though, I want to keep moving. But do feel free to keep asking um, questions if you want. Um, so, uh, cognitive flexibility, yeah, that, that's, you already know what it is. So what does it actually look like? So again, I already hinted at this. We have identified three tools that are relevant for, for every section and, and, and some of them for every question in the course. You can, well, the precise tool is basically the one you're probably already used to, the one you have used all throughout high school and probably throughout your college, which is taking the information that's in the question and writing it down and solving it, simplifying it, and getting to solution on your own, and then looking at the answer choices <clears throat> and just picking out the one that you've already gotten to on your own. That's the precise tool. I would say that the precise approach is almost always possible. On almost every question, it's at least theoretically possible. However, sometimes it's not at all the most efficient. Sometimes it can be very complicated, very long, or very confusing. So what else can we do? Well, there's the alternative approach, which basically means using some kind of tool that's going to get us to the answer, even if we're not exactly sure what happened along the way. That can be something like estimating, plugging in a number, using the answer choices, using the figure, if it's geometry, all kinds of stuff, um, which we talk about in detail in the course. And the last kind of tool is a logical tool which means implementing some kind of logical rule that we already know, one that we've studied, one that comes from outside, implementing it in a certain question, and, and without any calculation at all, cutting through sort of all of the unnecessary parts of the question to be just say, logically, it can't be any of these. It has to be this one. <clears throat> and again, if this sounds a little bit... Um, abstract, I'm going to show you guys a few examples to see what I mean. So when do we apply each of these? So the bad news is um, the answer is not, uh, you know, you apply precise when we have a circles question. You apply the logical every time that there's a multiplication and a division. If it were that, then I don't know, perhaps this webinar would be shorter or a course would be shorter, but it's it's more a little bit more complicated than that. Um, it you have to it's it's something that you answer on a question by question basis, and and the answer to the question depends on two things. The first is the question itself, right? Does this question look like one that simply going ahead and calculating is going to be um, a uh, possible and and be more than that um, efficient? Something that's gonna, we can do pretty quickly. Um, or is it something that that actually looks like that might be complicated, but <clears throat> but we have all kinds of stuff we can um, tools we can use, such as a figure we can play with or variables we can plug in numbers for, um, in order to use an alternative tool. Or maybe there's some kind of hint in it, some kind of logical cue that tells us we can use a logical rule. Um, so these are 
the question's characteristics. And the second thing we have to take into account is our own personal strengths and weaknesses, what we're good at. Are we good at calculating? Are we good at estimating? Are we good at kind of understanding the logical principle of a question? And the thing is, this part, you really can't just study. This part is really a question that the answer to will only come from uh, experience, from using all three of these tools a lot and getting to a point where you kind of know where your personal strengths and weaknesses are. And for this reason, I mean, th this is something that you work on a lot. In example, this is, we're always working on this, and, and this is, I think, a big, a big thing that we gain from that. So I, I hope uh, so far this has been clear enough what I mean in general about the, all three of these tools. Um, you guys are welcome to ask any questions if not. But um, I want to make it a lot more kind of real to you guys. And for that reason, um, we're going to start looking at some questions, see some examples of how to use um, these tools and which ones we'll use. So let's look at this question together. And I want you guys to be thinking not what is the solution, but what solution tool you would use for this. What solution tool do you think you should use? So of the 900 guests that attended a wedding, 36% were women. If 450 men left the wedding, the women would be what percentage of the remaining guests? So quick, uh, tell me what you guys think is the correct solution. Uh, not, not the correct solution, rather the correct solution tool to this one. So you should be seeing on your screen a uh, poll, a survey. What do you think is the fastest way to solve this question? And you should have the option to answer it. I see I see some of you have gone ahead and done that. I'm going to give you guys another uh, 20 questions or so. And by the way, if you're thinking, uh, Dave, how do you want me to answer it so quickly? We only looked at the question for about 10 seconds and already you're wanting me to decide how to solve it. That's kind of the point because these are decisions we're going to have to make very quickly throughout the test. So uh, try and make a determination. I'm going to wrap it up in about 10 seconds. I'll give you guys another 10 seconds. OK, so interesting results. As you guys can see, a clear Clear result, clear result majority. Most of you guys think um, precise, <clears throat> sorry, is the way to go, which is interesting. Um, so let's talk about it. Um, by the way, I'm just going to say this now. As I said earlier, <clears throat> in a different context, context to Francisco, this will be available later. So even though I am going to kind of run through it a little bit, all the questions we're going to look at, uh, don't worry about it. You'll be able to solve it at your leisure later if you want. <clears throat> Try and focus less on the exact, uh, on the details and more on, on kind of the path I'm taking. So now that I've said that, so all you guys that said precise, you're not wrong. Let's start with that. We definitely can use precise. How? Let, let's, let's see what it looks like. So it looks like this. We say 36% of 900 is what's that? Well, 36% is the same as 36 over 100 and times 900. So we can take off the both of the zeros. That leaves us with 36 times 9, which is kind of hard, but we can break that into 36 times 10 minus 1, which is 360 minus 36, which is 324. So that's the number of women in the wedding in the beginning. Okay. And then 450 men left, so we had 900 people, 450 left, we have 450 guests remaining. So the percentage of the remaining guests that are women is 324 over 450. Of course, that's not a percentage. To get that in percentage, we have to simplify. So if we take out 3 as a common denominator, we get 108 over 150. We take out 3 again, we get 36 over 50. We then multiply by 2, 72 over 100, 72%. Answer choice D. So that's the solution. But look on the screen right now. There's kind of a lot 
of information there. And I said it now pretty quickly, but I don't know about you guys. It would it would take me longer to to actually go ahead and, and solve this one. Um, it definitely would take me longer. So, <clears throat> and and this is the reason why, while possible, precise is not actually the necessarily the most efficient, unless you're very you know good at calculations. Let's see what a lot what a different approach, what a logical solution approach would look like in this case okay so what would it look like well we know that percentage by definition is the part out of the whole which and here the percentage we're being asked about is the women out of all of the guests now we know what the percentage was in the beginning it was 36 percent and then what happened well the women stayed the same none of them left but the guests in total the whole it became half so that means that the numerator isn't changing. The denominator became half of what it was, which is like dividing by a half. I mean, it's not like it's, it is dividing by a half, which is equivalent to multiplying by two. So if before we had 36%, now we're going to have 72%. And that's it. Look at it. We didn't have to do any calculations you know, aside from 36 times two. And just like that, we got to the solution. Um, and this is a reason why <clears throat> the logical approach can be more efficient than the precise approach. And in fact, we, this is, we measure these things. So um, people who solve the precise approach, on average, it took them 150 seconds, which is two and a half minutes. And remember, we have, um, and on the Jerry, we have an average in the quant set of two minutes per question. So two and a half minutes is long. It's longer than we want to be when we solve questions. So that's, um, yeah, that's kind of slow. And whereas logical took a little bit less than two minutes. So that's, that, that's fine. That's an okay time. So this is an example of, of, uh, of a reason I want to use another one. R.A. Carr, you may ask me a question. Feel free. Just give me a second to read it. <clears throat> so you're saying in hindsight, this is a good approach. But how do you make sure that in a 20-set question, I guess in, in a section you mean, you're still sharp enough not to make logical mistakes? So look, being sharp enough is a problem that has to do with, with other things as well. I mean, not being sharp enough can also lead you to make calculation mistakes, which is something we're susceptible with precise solutions right so being sharp isn't isn't just a problem for logic right saying being sharp is 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 a challenge anyway but that being said you know if you're asking this question you know th that it might be, it might be that this is would be the case for you i you know i don't know you but um yeah for some of us maybe we're good at logical thinking in the beginning but as the section wears on uh, our logical skills become depleted, but while, whereas calculations, you know, we're always going to be, they're always going to be uh, consistent and we can kind of count on them. And, and if that's the case, you know, yeah, maybe you want to stick to precise. Um, but for some people, it might be exactly the opposite. As I just said, for some people, it might be, you know, calculations, you just get sloppy, but whereas logic, you can always kind of do. I think the, the point I'm trying to make is you're not going to know until you've a, learn to use these tools and B, actually use them a little bit or more than a little bit and, and get used to them and gain some insight into yourself, into what you're good at and when it, what into you're good at using. So that's kind of my answer. I, I hope that um, that that helps a little, just a little bit, but uh, feel free to ask a follow-up. Um, but anyway, yeah, my, my point here, real, my general point here to all of you wasn't, you know, go ahead and use the logical approach. Don't use the precise approach. Absolutely not. We recommend using the precise approach around a third of the time. The point is, is um, A, I just wanted to show you guys the precise approach isn't always correct because I think for most of us, that's what's ingrained in us from high school and from college. That's the way we've learned how to solve. And on the GRE, it's not necessarily the most efficient way a lot of the time. And more generally, the point is just um, there are a lot of solution tools and we have to get used to kind of learning the cues of when they're relevant and when they aren't. The reason that we can see here that it was relevant, 
I think was probably the fact that the women didn't even change, which should have kind of lit a light bulb, which is like, well, wait a minute. If they're not even changing, then we don't even have to do a calculation. But again, these are things that we learn. How long would it take to master the logical way to ace the GRE quants? Um, it would take, uh, well, we're going to talk in the end about what we think a study plan looks like. Um, but basically, it would take going through a course, an exam pile course. Um, that's what we do throughout the whole course. We, we study all three of the tools for all of the sections, all the t all the subtopics that is on the GRE in, in both verbal and quant. And in, in the end, we, we know them. Um, and it takes about, about two months. Um, we'll get to that in the end, but that's basically the answer. All right, I want to keep moving. I want to look at another question with you guys. Two printers run simultaneously. An inkjet, an inkjet, sorry, printer that prints at a uniform rate of 80 pages every 15 minutes, and a laser printer that prints 100 pages every 10 minutes. How many minutes will it take for them to print 230 pages? So again, I want you guys not to solve the question. I want you guys to think how you would solve the question. How 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 you would want to use it. Um, these were your results last time. You guys all thought that it was precise. Um, oops, sorry about that. But maybe we'll try. Let's do it again. Let's. You guys tell me again what you think is the correct way to solve. What is the fastest way to solve this question, in your opinion? And I can already see the results are going to be different than last time, which. I suppose is a good, <clears throat> it means you were listening at the very least. I don't know if you made the right conclusion from listening, but it definitely means something has changed, which is interesting to see. Okay, I'm going to give you guys just another five more seconds because I have a feeling most of who is, was going to vote has voted. So pretty evenly split between precise, logical, and those that are just feel perhaps more confused now than when I started, which is fine. Nobody thinks alternative, which is interesting. Remember that. Let's let's go back to the question. Um, okay. Again, I'm going to do this kind of quickly. Don't worry about it. You will be able to access the question later. So I'm going to do it the alternative way, which none of you thought was the right way. So let's see what that means. I mean, it makes sense. We haven't really given an example yet of what an alternative solution even means. So what do I mean when I say an alternative solution? Well, I'm well. There are all kinds of alternative solutions, but in this case, one way to go about it would be to say, "Well, you know, I don't know how to make do this calculation, or maybe I do, but I, I don't want to get into it." I'm just going to say to myself, "Look, I know the answer is either A, B, C, D, or E. You know, it can't be any answer, any number in the world. It can only be one of these five numbers. I'm just going to try them out. I'm going to try out the numbers. <clears throat> sorry, one by one." And when I find one that works, that's it, because only one answer can be correct. So let's start with that. Let's start with answer A. And let's say that the answer is 10. Let's say it took 10 minutes to print 230 pages. Well, what does that mean? Well, or let's not worry. I mean, rather, let's test it. What happens in 10 minutes? So in 10 minutes, printer 1 is going to print. Well, if he prints 80 every 15 minutes, so 10 is 2 thirds of 15. So 2 thirds of 80, and it might take us a second to get to this, but it's around 60. It's not exactly 60. Don't, don't correct me. Um, it's not exactly 60, but, it's, but it, we can estimate and say it's approximately 60 because estimation is another tool we can use while we use alternatives. So it's around 60. And printer 2, there's no reason, no need to do any calculations because we know that a printer two prints exactly 100 pages every 10 minutes. So all in all, in 10 minutes, both of them together are going to print around 160 pages. So nowhere near 230 pages. And even though our number here isn't accurate, we know it's not the right number because it's just very far from the right number. So we can go ahead and rule out answer choice A. And then what do we want to do after that? Well, looking at the answer choices, <clears throat> we have to go from 160 to 230. That's more, but it's not 
much more. It's not two times more. So, and it's definitely not three times more. So 20 and 30, D and E, probably not the answer. In fact, I would eliminate them right now. Meaning that we're really headed down to two answers, B and C, 15 and 18. So let's go ahead and try one of them. Let's try 15, which looks a little bit easier to use. So here now with printer one, um, <clears throat> the inkjet printer that is, we don't have to do any calculations. We know exactly that it prints exactly 80 pages. And printer two, we have to do a calculation, but it's a very simple one. If in 10 minutes it does 100 pages, then it's going to do 150 in 15 minutes. 150 plus 80, 230 pages total. It works, and we don't have to keep solving. Another important point. Once we see that B works, we don't have to check any other because only one answer can work. And that's it. I mean, that's at least, that's of course some questions such as this where <clears throat> there's only one correct solution, right? Remember on the GRE, sometimes we have questions that have um, multiple correct solutions, but first of all, you'll be able to tell because the answer choices will be squares and not circles. And more to the point, the questions will be phrased differently. They'll be which of the following could be um, you know, possible values or, or something like that. That's not the case here. There's one answer, we found it, that's it, we're done. And again, I think, I hope you guys will agree with me that, um, that this was quick, this was, this was quite efficient. Um, so this is what I wanted to show you guys about using the PAL um, in the PAL algorithm, as we call it, using the different PAL system um, with some quant questions. If you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. And if not, I want to move on to our, our second tool that we are going to talk about today. <clears throat> uh, so the first tool that we've talked about so far, <clears throat> this was all under the heading of cognitive flexibility. And the second tool we're going to talk about is rapid improvement. This is the second thing that we think sets apart 160 GRE scores, rapid improvement. So what do we mean by rapid improvement? Well, <clears throat> let's look at this graph. In fact, I'll give you guys just a second to look at it your, yourselves and try and make sense of it, um, what you think it's talking about. And then I will uh, talk about it myself. So, okay, so what we see here is um, a visual form of a plotting of what's a common phenomenon in GRE studies, which we call plateauing. And what happens in plateauing is that students, at the beginning of their studies, they keep getting better and better, right? They're in this part here on the left. Um, they're very sharp and steep incline in their improvement graph. Um, they're learning something new every day and it's exciting and it's fun. And then it starts going, getting a little bit slower, the improvement and slower until finally it levels out. And at this point, additional practice only yields the same results. And, and we hear this from students who say, you know, I've been solving thousands of questions and I, and I just can't get past whatever it may be, 153. I just can't seem to break it. And the thing is, is that this is actually very natural because what's happening is that in the beginning, um, so think about it this way, the GRE section of our brain is kind of like a muscle. And in the beginning, <clears throat> sorry, we're working it out and it's getting stronger and stronger with each, with each use. However, this muscle does have a limit. And at a certain point, we will have learned all of the material and we will have reached basically our limit of our, our question solving uh, speed ability, right? Where, right? We can only read so fast, we can only calculate so fast. And we're not going to get much faster if we just keep trying. Um, at this point, improvement becomes a lot harder. And this is what happens to a lot of GRE students. And what separates the good GRE students from the great GRE students, from the ones that get good scores and the ones that get 
really good scores is exactly this, that really good uh, Jerry students manage to keep improving even after they've already learned all the material and even after they've kind of reached their natural level of speed. So how do they do that? So, so there are a few ways, and we're going to talk about them now. What's a really great Jerry score? Well, well, the name of this this lesson, right, is how to be a 160 GRE scorer. And I'm going to put up the screen now. And the reason is, if you look at the um, percentiles, so well, the truth is that actually in verbal and in quant, 160 is, is different. Um, so in verbal, 160 is, is very, very good. It means you're in the 86th percentile. And in quant, it's actually lowers. So I would say in quant, a really good score, you know, is probably 164 or above. That would be when you're in the 86th percentile. But anyway, of course, whatever. I mean, the great and good are, are relative terms, and it's actually not important. What's important is that you get the score that you need in order to go to the program that you want and the school that you want. So what matters is, is really what, what the average there is and what they consider a good score. So that's not really the point, though, because um, the truth is I'm not, I'm not saying all of you, after watching this webinar, will tomorrow be able to get 160. Um, obviously, you know, we all have different abilities and, um, and, and our performances are a function of them as well. What I am saying is, um, hopefully if you guys implement things we talk about here, you'll be able to get to your own personal best score, your own personal, um, peak of your abilities and and anyway, here I'm, I'm phrasing it as the difference between good Jerry students and great Jerry students, but the truth is these rapid improvement are, are the difference for, I think, every student between being his own personal um, okay level and his own personal very good level. So without further ado, what makes uh, good improvement? So one thing is teach, is, uh, sorry, is treating your mistakes as opportunities. And I realize this might sound cliched but it's it's true um what do i mean by treating them as opportunities so there's a tendency when studying for a test like gre because you're solving a lot of questions and you're feeling confident there's a tendency when you make a mistake to say to yourself bummer but you know why did i make this mistake because because i'm an idiot it's not because I don't know the material. It's just because I, I I screwed up. I got a little bit silly, and and that's it. It doesn't it doesn't mean anything. It's not a real mistake. I know this. Okay, and you, this usually this usually be a mistake when you know you make a mistake and you and you look at the solution and you say, oh, of course, of course, of course, the solution. I knew that. And I'm here to tell you that we should fight the urge to just kind of brush mistakes aside and to keep moving. And rather, we should ask ourselves as a serious question, why did I make a mistake? Now, the one reason <clears throat> might be, you know, something that has to do with the material. You know, you just didn't know the material well enough. You forgot how to do the Pythagoras theorem. Hopefully not. But, you know, that's an example. It could happen. And if that happens, it's pretty clear what needs to be done. You have to go back and study that material. However, it can be something like like what I was just describing. It can be something silly, something that doesn't have to do with knowing the material but has to do with something technical about solving the test. And the point is, is that if we make a mis silly mistake more than once, then we're probably doing something wrong in our habits and the way we are used to working that we can change, that we can adopt a new habit. And it can be something as simple as not doing calculations in your head, doing them on the piece of paper, or writing down all the answers on the page and crossing them out one by one until we we know what the right answer is and not just marking the wrong one because we got confused. It could be all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and, but the point is, is that in order to, again, these aren't one size fits all, rather you have to analyze your own mistakes and keep a running list of mistakes or mistake types rather, which is, you know, mistakes that repeat more than once. And then you can say to yourself, this is how 
I need to approach this one. And another thing, another reason that you can make a, do make a mistake is a strategic reason. What I mean by that? Well, I mean you didn't use the right tool. You didn't really use the right pal tool, right? And and actually, this doesn't isn't even only for mistakes. It could be one the question that you got right, but it took you three minutes. And the reason was you went for, say, the precise tool when an alternative tool could really have shaved off half of that time. And if you make a mistake for that reason, then you need to, I would say, have even, even a little bit deeper introspection and ask yourself, why, what about this question was the clue that another answer solution was relevant? Why did I miss this clue? And wh how next time will I pick up on this clue? What is the rule of thumb? And the rule, and it can be like an actual rule that you say, you know, you get to. Next time and all the times that I see variables in both the question and the answer, I'm just going to plug in a number. I'm just going to say x equals 1 and let's see what happens. I'm not going to try and solve. It can be something like that. So, um, so you get these by by making a running list of mistake tools, and, that, and then you implement. Then once you have um, analyzed a certain type of mistake, gotten to a conclusion of how to tackle that mistake, then you go ahead and you seek out similar questions. Okay, and you can do that on our site. You can do that using the official guide for the GRE. Um, all kinds of ways. So, um, and again, we, we kind of, not kind of, we help you do this as the course is going already. Rather, we make part of this mistake list for you by asking you after you make mistakes, why did you make this mistake? And then we, we know what your weaknesses are, and then we, we already are feeding you questions that work on this tool. So you're already incorporating um, part of this uh, on example. That is okay. What does a winning plan look like? So I already touched upon this very briefly earlier, but and we have a whole other webinar just about this, about how to build a customized study plan. But I still want to give you guys an overview of what we think it looks like. So in general, we think a study plan should be 120 hours in total. Um, we should be spread out ideally over six to eight weeks. Um, this is if you are a native English speaker. If you're not a native English speaker, um, you should be spending another 30 hours just working on your English skills. So that would be 150 hours, and ideally still spread out over the same amount of time, six to eight weeks. What's the breakdown? How, what do we, how do we use that time? So 20 hours for watching the intro videos, um, and learning the fundamentals, just the material. Uh, 20 hours for watching lesson videos and learning how to implement the different solution tools for each topic. 30 hours for practicing, for solving questions, improving, researching your mistakes, that's what like, we just talked about. 30 hours for taking um, the practice tests, the official uh, ETS, Power Prep Practice Tests, um, taking the official guide, and um, revisions, um, and another 20 hours for improving your verbal abilities for everyone, which can be stuff like just reading, reading the newspaper, reading magazines, and also working on your vocabulary because uh, we have lists of vocabulary you need to memorize because vocabulary is quite high on the GRE. And again, if you're not an English speaker, so this last rubric should be 50 hours, if not 20. Spend, give yourself another 30 hours, and ideally incorporate it in your daily schedule. So if you're studying in you know, the afternoon or the evening, that's fine, but maybe open your day with some English reading and close your day with some vocabulary memorization or the opposite, something like that. Um, R.A. Carr asks, can other material be added to supplement what you're proposing, OG or wordless from other companies? Look, uh, can it? Yeah, of course, you guys can do you know, whatever you want, you're free people. But um, the important point is that it doesn't, it doesn't need to be. Uh, our course uh, contains all the material you need to study. Um, the only caveat to that, not a caveat, but the only, the only thing that, that we say is if you want more practice questions at a certain point, 
then 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 we recommend supplementing with the with the official guide because those questions are official and they're the only ones that can give you real questions from the GRE. And that's if, but that just if you want to practice more and more and more. But again, and this kind of goes back to what I've been talking about this whole past hour. We purposely don't think you need to solve thousands and thousands of questions. Rather, we think you need to solve less questions, maybe hundreds of questions, but take the time to really analyze them. And um, well, first of all, the questions should be ones that are optimized for you, questions that are your level of difficulty, which is what we do during the course. That's A. And second of all, spend the time to analyze those questions. So I hope that answers your question. Two, what is the value proposition with a tutor? I'm not sure what you mean. But anyway, actually, these are great questions for in just a few minutes. When I finish, I'm going to have, I'm going to open the floor. So just ask that in a few minutes and uh, maybe expand a little bit on what you mean. So just, let's just keep moving. Uh, what is the winning study plan? So in general, so we're saying six to eight weeks. That's around 60 days, two months. So the first 50 days on example will be just go ahead, just go straight. There's there's a trail of, of you should do this and this and this, and then and you just follow it. And then, um, oh no, and sorry, not then. And then during those fifty days, how do you, how do you, how do you spread them out? So you spend around two days per topic. So the topic of um, algebra or or um, fractions and percents, you spend one day learning the material, watching the intro, and then you spend the next day practicing. Give or take, okay. Um, that those are the first fifty days, and, and plus you read for an hour, an hour and a half, as we said. And then the last ten days is for reviewing and for taking practice tests. So take an exam every other day, and every other day that you're not taking an exam, go over a review, work on topics that you found hard. And, um, and of course, the ones that the practice test the day before revealed is ones that you need to work on. Um, and also be reviewing stuff that you compiled during your first 50 days, your lists of your mistakes and notes that you've, uh, of, uh, that you've uh, taken for yourself. Um, and to that end, keep an error log, keep a mistake log, which I, I think I already talked about. It's very useful to track your personal mistakes. And um, and and take your time when you make a mistake. Don't just keep running, but stop for a second um, and try and understand what what happened there. And ask yourself, what do I do if I see um, a similar question? How will I be able to not repeat the same mistake? Finally, the day before the test, take the day off. You've earned it on your final day. Glory, crush crush the GRE. Go ahead and crush it. So, guys, that's really it. We feel like we've gone through a long, long path together. And I want to remind you guys, thank you guys for being with me for these past 45 minutes, more, more than that. And and uh, as an expression of my gratitude, you can take me up on our offer uh, for the next 24 hours of 25% off any of our GRE courses. Um, there's in the chat window, uh, which we sent in the very beginning, and I'm gonna send the link in a second again. And that's really it, guys. Um, these were two tools, um, cognitive flexibility and um, rapid improvement, which we think set apart uh, very good Jerry students uh, from just good Jerry students. So I hope this was helpful. And again, I'm uh, I'm not running away. I'm still here for another 10 minutes. Um, so feel free to ask any and all GRE-related, example-related questions. Um, starting with Francisco, who asked us all of the PAL material course online. I hope I understand your question correctly. Yeah, all of ExamPAL courses online. You sign on to ExamPAL, and it is all online um i hope that's what you meant by a question you can go ahead by the way you can go there right now and sign up for free there's also a a, a trial period um but it, but anyway you have to uh, sign up for the course right no books yes there are no books correct it is all online that that's that's part of our mantra we believe that you um 
And you don't need books. You need, you need the course. That's It's all there. Um, that's the answer to the question. Uh, I know it's surprising because we're all used to using fish, all these books, but um, but a book isn't the best way to study for an adaptive test. Books are not adaptive, they're not, and they're not computers. With, uh, but a online course is a computer adaptive, and that's why we don't we we use them and not books. <clears throat> um, are a car you were using some you were asking something earlier about the value proposition with a tutor oh i think you were asking um would it be helpful to use a tutor on top of the course yeah for some people not for everyone we don't think it's necessary and that's why it's not part of the course but it is um it is a service that we offer because for some students it is valuable so um so yeah, as part of our package, you, you get like credits on the course, which you can use towards all kinds of things. You can use towards having an essay checked or getting like a report, a detailed report on, on all, of your, all, all of your data and how you've been doing. And one thing you can do is get a, a tutor session uh, with one of our tutors. One of them is me. Um, and then you can actually see my face, which I'm sure was exciting to you. Um, we have a Skype session. Um, a personal uh, Skype session. So, so yes, and 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 um, and one of the um, one of the upsides there is that we know a lot about you because we have we are we see all of your data on the site, so we know your weaknesses and your strengths, and, and we use that in our sessions. And and definitely for some students that adds value, but not for all of them is it necessary. Um, Francisco asks the course lessons are adaptive. Yes. Or rather rather the practice is adaptive. The lessons are the same for everyone, although they are interactive, which is to say there are questions in the lesson and we're we're tracking how you do on the lesson. But the lesson is for everyone. We teach you how to be adaptive. That's what we talk about in the lesson. We talk about for this type for you know in this topic we can use the alternative approach for this you can use the precise approach for that you can use logical approach for this but it's up to you and then in the actual practice section it's it's adaptive we we see how you're doing and we and the, and that affects the questions you see and the solutions we are for you so that so it's adaptive um Gloria asked, how can we implement a time strategy? I'm not entirely sure what a time strategy means. If what you mean by that is, is um, I guess you're probably saying, <clears throat> I guess you probably mean time management in the test itself. So yeah, that's that's an entire topic in and of itself. Um, and that's something we, we work on. Um, but... Uh, just in like in general, basically you have to see where your level is. You have to take a few practice tests, see how you, you are with time. Um, why? Because because not every not all of us are going to solve all the questions, and not all of us should try and solve all the questions. Some of us are a little bit um, our pace is a little bit slower, and we should ahead of time decide to skip one or two or three even or four whatever questions and just go for um, you know however however many questions it may be. And then we have to kind of build um, a plan, or we all have to build a plan. Actually, doesn't even if we're not skipping questions. How many questions we're going for every fifteen minutes? That's how I recommend to slice up this the the, the section, and that way you can test yourself and um, and adapt throughout. So if you see that you're you're ahead of your pace, then that's great. You can spend some more time. Whereas if you see that you're behind your pace, then you just skip a question and, and you keep moving instead of getting bogged down at the end. Um, hope that answers. All right, Carr asked, how will this make a difference for people that have been studying on the GRE, the GRE for more than a year? Well, it really depends on what they've been doing the GRE for more than a year. But, um, but, but I mean, in the general answer is, uh, a lot of people study a lot, but as we mentioned, not necessarily improving at a certain point. And um, and what we try and do is is pinpoint ex really um, new solution tools. First of all, just ones that you might not be aware of, and B really work on improving the weaknesses. 
that's kind of just the, the one, the one, the very short answer. But that's really answer. I mean, the truth, yeah. I mean, if you already been studying for you, you might skip the intros because you already know the fundamental material. But the lessons will have a lot of stuff that you definitely aren't familiar with, even if you're taking another course. And practice also uh, should be throwing you some curveballs. Um, Zauerbeck says, my question is related to the AWA section. Will I get exactly the same tax because it's presented on the ETS website and SA pool section? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by the same task. There, there are two types of AWAs, right? An analyze, an issue, analyze, an argument. Um, you will get one of each, and, and the very general guidelines for what to do with them are on the website, and, and they will be replicated in the test. Those are the guidelines, right? And analyze an argument, you have to analyze the argument and, and provide a critique of it. And analyze an issue, you have to basically say your opinion on the very general kind of issue, it says. Um, so that basically stays the same, although even there, there can be kind of small nuances. They analyze the issue, they can suddenly say, you know, state your opinion and make sure to address even the ways that it could be wrong or something like that. The point is the wording isn't exactly the same. But anyway, the actual issue and the actual argument are absolutely not going to be the same as the website. They're going to be different each time. That's that, that I can assure you. So you can't prepare for a specific essay. Um, are there any more questions before we wrap this up? Um, okay, I think all right, Car has one. Um, in the meantime, I think this might be the last question I have time to take. Um, though I'm very, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoy, enjoying this. I'm enjoying you guys' questions. Um makes it a lot more fun. Is the seven point guarantee across both sections or in total? Well, the GRE doesn't have a total score. The GRE has three scores, the quant score, the verbal score, and the AWA score. So it's it's for it's for each of the sections. But um but, but just go to our site and, and look at the actual um policy um you know before you uh, jump in. Uh, just so make sure you understand all the all the data is there. Are we compounding the AWA? No, we're not compounding the AWA because the AWA um, it's a different it's a different scale and um, yeah, and, and you, a seven point guarantee isn't relevant there because the scores there are between one and six. Um, so yeah, just qu just quantity verb. Correct. Um, which which most people that's what's important for them. Um, generally speaking. All right, guys, thank you very much. I hope you guys uh, had a good time uh, as much as I did. Uh, I really did. And I hope to see you guys on ExamPal. So um, if you're there, uh, we have a chat and just right there, and I will be there. Um, so thank you, guys. I hope to see you guys soon. Have a good one.